I think visualization in most cases, as far as I'm concerned, was a lot better than actually going off in the corner and practicing the kata physically over and over and over again. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 256. Today, we welcome Sensei Chuck Merriman to the show. If you're new to the show, I want to thank you for tuning in. If you're coming back, thanks for coming back. I appreciate your time, and as I've said on the show a number of times, if you weren't here, I would just be a crazy guy talking to himself. If you're not sure who I am, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. I'm your host on this show, and I'm a very lucky guy because martial arts, in various ways, is my job. If you want to check out the stuff that I and the rest of the Whistlekick team put together, you can find that at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes for this or any of the other episodes, you can find them whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Let's talk about today's show. Sensei Chuck Merriman is one of those people that I've been wanting on the show since day one. He's been in the stories of so many of our past guests. He's taught past guests, and he's made a tremendous impact on the martial arts, not only in the United States, but worldwide. We've heard a lot about him, so this episode is kind of overdue. I'm excited to bring him on, and I hope you'll help me welcome him to the show. Merriman Sensei, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. I've been looking forward to talking to you. I don't remember when we started talking about this. It was a little while ago. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, but it's happening. It's happening now, and, and I'm looking forward to talking to you because of who you are, but also because you've been mentioned on the show quite a number of times. We've had some of your students and some of your students' <laughs> students on the show, and and people have spoken of you. So now we get to kind of fill in that gap in this martial arts family tree. I, I deny all those accusations, and uh, <laughs> I have written proof. <laughs> well, they were all good things, so I don't know that you oh, want to deny good. them. Good. I'll, <laughs> I'll take them then. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, we need some context, and the best place to start with context is the start. Mm -hmm. How did you find martial arts? Um, I'm not sure I found it or it found me. Um I uh, I was never big on team sports. Uh, I you know I was too short for basketball, too slow for track, too skinny for football. So um, I kind of like to do things where I'm responsible for my own actions. So I was working at the um, General Dynamics uh, Electric Boat Company in Connecticut and uh, building submarines, and uh, a guy that was um, working with me was taking judo in uh, in a small dojo in Norwich, Connecticut. And uh, that intrigued me and I asked him if he would uh, take me to a class. And he, he took me and I sat down and I watched and I fell in love with it. And uh, uh, ever since then, it's just been a steady progression of from judo into karate and, and uh, so on. I still love judo and uh, I think it was a good foundation for my karate training, but uh, so I think in a way it kind of found me instead of me finding it. <laughs> mm. A number of the folks that we've spoken with on the show who started their martial arts in the, you know, 50s, 60s, had judo as that foundation. It seemed like judo was more prominent back then. What was oh, it? Mm. It, it? Well, first, I guess, is, is that accurate? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, because um, first of all, uh, what East Coast was kind of a uh, um, stepchild, so to speak, for the martial arts because the, the West Coast got most of the influx of instructors coming over because that was their first stop. And mm. rather than go any further, they, most of them stayed out there. So um, it, karate wasn't that well known in the 60s, uh, not on the East Coast. And judo was the big thing. And uh, uh, I got into karate just kind of accidentally also, being that uh, uh, the judo instructor, uh, for some reason, just never showed up. I went to the dojo one night, and everybody was standing outside, and uh, <laughs> I go, what's going on? I don't know. We're waiting for sensei, and sensei never showed up. To this day, I don't know what happened, but by that time, I was so... Intrigued with judo, that I had to find a place to train, 
And basically, the only place to train uh, was Boston and New York, the big cities. So I went to New York City and I found a dojo in uh, the Judo Twins on 38th Street. And uh, I explained the situation and uh, I said, I want to train, but, uh, you know, I, I live in Connecticut. And he said, well, uh, if you want to, you could sleep in the dojo and, you know, help clean it, keep it clean and open it and close it. And, uh, and we won't charge you for class. So I jumped on that and. I was married at the time, and I went back home, and I told my wife, I said, uh, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is I found a dojo to train in judo. And the bad news is you're going to have to go back and live with your mother for a while. <laughs> and uh, she said, fine. She did that. And uh, I slept in that dojo for a year and uh, took classes. And at the same time, they had started karate classes. And so I, being as that I was living in the dojo, I was started doing judo from uh, six to eight and karate from eight to ten, uh, almost every night. And uh, that was my introduction to karate. <laughs> mm. Now, obviously, at some point, karate became your first love. What was it that you found in karate that wasn't in judo that ultimately made you choose that? Well, judo at the time in the East Coast, uh, especially New York, was pretty, pretty rough, rough training, uh, hard competition. Uh, and, you know, in judo, you get thrown around a lot or you throw people around a lot. And uh, uh, the competition uh, uh, for judo was um, very, very high level. And um, I just I, I just got. Uh, so intrigued with karate that I wanted to spend more time doing that. And I couldn't train as much for the com judo competition. And uh, I decided uh, it was time that I chose one or the other. And I just like karate a lot better. Again, it, it was uh, the fact that I saw Sensei doing kata, and that intrigued me, really intrigued me. And uh, I asked him if he'd teach me some of that, and he said, yes. And, you know, but first you have to learn basics and so on and so forth. I said, fine. And uh, I started my training with him and uh, gradually just weaned off the judo pretty much altogether. But I still taught judo to my uh, when I started teaching karate. I taught judo, basic judo to my uh, students also. Do you think there's a there's a synergy in there, or is it a complement to karate? You know, what, what was the value you saw in in offering judo as well as karate? Well, first of all, um, I think we we all agree. I would think that uh, in physical situations, a lot of them end up on the ground sure. uh, when you're protecting yourself or or defending yourself. A lot of times it winds up on the ground, and I figured in order to to take care of that situation, teach them some basic judo to where if if they had to defend themselves and it went on the ground, they wouldn't be totally lost. They'd have some idea of how to maneuver on the ground and uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, take care of themselves in that situation. Mm. Makes sense. I think that gives us a bit about who you are enough that we can move on. I know we're going to go back and plug in sure. some, some more pieces as we go, find out the, the puzzle that is you. <laughs> I'm wondering now, what of all the stories that you know, the, the things you've experienced, what's your favorite martial arts story? There's a few of them, but when I, I think it, it would have to be because it was so dramatic, uh, when Sensei Urban left to Goju Kai, and I was training with him at the time, and uh, in Chinatown Dojo in New York City, and uh, he left the Goju Kai, and Sensei Urban was always very dramatic about everything, even during training, and uh, it was just his personality. And 
the famous hatchet story, so they call it, is when he called a meeting of some of the some of his uh, higher level students. Sandan, third dan in the dojo was the highest rank, and we had maybe four or five of us that were sandan. And he called a meeting of us, and he said that he was going to sever his ties ties with Japan, but he did it in a dramatic way with reaching under the table and pulling out a meat cleaver <laughs> and slamming it into the table and saying, I sever my ties with Japan. And that's got to be one one of the top stories right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the energy in the room must have just been sucked out. Uh, it was, uh, it was, well, we didn't know, you know, we all look kind of what's, what's going to happen next. <laughs> we weren't sure, you know, then, uh, uh, like I say, he, he was so dramatic and everything that uh, uh, and then he, he said, you either stay with me or you leave. And uh, uh, I think two people got up and left. And I was just, you know, young at the time, uh, kind of young in, in karate. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I just sat there until he told us we could leave. <laughs> and I and then I got up and left, and I, I didn't leave him at the time. I left Sensei Urban when he started the American Goju thing, when he, he left the Goju Kai and started his own style of Goju, so to speak. That's a subject that, you know, I, I'm not going to poke you too too <laughs> focused, but I'm wondering if you might share your thoughts on the, the more general occurrence of the politics that pop up in martial arts, the, you know, but whether it's rank or it's organizations or, you know, any of the multitude of issues that come up. And to be blunt, you've been training a long time. You've seen a lot of things. You've met a lot of people. And so I'm wondering what your perspective is on, on the whole political aspect of martial arts. Well, obviously politics plays a part in, everything we do, daily life, one way or another. Um, you know, if you uh, own a home and it's a homeowner's association, you got politics. <laughs> and you got somebody trying to tell you how, how you should live. Uh, I don't... We all try to avoid that as much as possible. And if we can't avoid it, we have to figure out a way to deal with it uh, constructively for our own benefit. But um, uh, rank... And kata has always been a way to control people, I feel. Um, if you believe that a certain organization or a certain person can issue you a, a valid rank as opposed to anybody else, then they pretty much uh, own you. And that this is the only way to do this kata, and this is the only person that can teach it to you. Again, uh, you're pretty much uh, stuck with that. And uh, over the years, we've seen hundreds of organizations come and go, and usually they're, uh, they're not formed for the right reason. They're formed for um, uh, personal reasons, personal gain or something. And uh, uh, I've been through a few of them myself, and um, uh, none of them ever really worked out for me. Uh, until I joined, um, when in, in the early 90s, I went to Okinawa and started training in the Jindokan. And um, when Miyazato Sensei was alive, uh, there was no political things going on in our dojo, none whatsoever. Uh, it was just training and uh, uh, no, no favorites, no pets, no special treatment for anybody. Just train. And... Um, so that that was a good feeling that you never had to worry about the other the, the political aspect of it, but uh, uh, I don't know. It, I don't think I think politics is un, unavoidable. Uh, you just have to learn how to deal with it mm. to your own benefit. Sure, and you know you you mentioned this one organization that seemed to to work, and I've known a few. And the common thread seems to be integrity. The people at the top have a tremendous amount of integrity. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why in most cases it doesn't work because when we say integrity, uh, if you start a group or an organization uh, to benefit yourself for either position, power or rank or whatever, then obviously it can't work. Uh, that'll that'll work for a very, very short time until people catch on that uh, it isn't have any benefit to them personally. And, you know, it's just um, like I said, it, it's that's never going to end, I don't think, because people are people. And um, many people are involved in the martial arts for that uh, to gain position or rank or uh, uh, power or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I think we're stuck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right, unfortunately. Yeah. When it comes to your life outside of martial arts, are there other hobbies or, or things that you're passionate about? Yeah, and I know this is going to sound funny, but I do a lot of crossword puzzles. I love them. <laughs> I, I buy books and books and and constantly doing um, um crossword puzzles one of the reasons is that it stimulates the mind it, it's a, a, it teaches me a lot uh it enhances my vocabulary um it uh challenges my mind constantly and i think that's especially in later years and uh when people are battling dementia and and alzheimer's and things like that uh it's terrible that's uh, you know and I think something along the lines of like me being involved in crossword puzzles that it's really good for the mind keeps your mind very active mm. um I'm not big on sports I like football um uh, I like to watch football um uh, even with the controversy going <laughs> out today <laughs> uh, uh, a good friend of mine and who trained with me uh, uh specifically was a sensei Andre Tippett from the Patriots so uh, I got to go to a lot of games and uh, when he was playing, and uh, uh, obviously when I met a lot of the people on the team on the Patriots, it even becomes more interesting because I'm watching them on a personal level, just rather than uh, a detached uh, uh, spectator. Mm. But uh, other than that, not uh, not too many interests. I've heard a number of football players and and coaches even attempt to bring martial arts to their teams, you know, with, with the belief mm-hmm. that it would help them with, you know, lateral movement and footwork and, and the ability to redirect your opponent's energy, you know, something like alignment on a football team. Is that why he had come to you? Uh, no, he, um, Sensei Andre was, uh, he had trained early on uh, in New Jersey, I think in Shotokan. And then <clears throat> uh, he, Obviously, he was living in the Boston area, and uh, he got uh, uh, got off into training in Wichita, and uh, was Sensei Steve Banchek, and uh, uh, because of um, our proximity, he was in. I was in Connecticut. He was in Boston, and we'd see each other at tournaments, or uh, because he was a competitor, also. And um, uh, we just got talking to each other, and he said, you know, he'd like to come down and visit the dojo. And I said, sure. And he came down, and he trained, trained with us, and um, uh, gradually the friendship grew. And um, eventually, uh, uh, when I had my professional team, uh, during off-season, he traveled with my professional team. And uh, we've just been friends ever since. But I, I noticed uh, when I would watch him play, I saw a lot of a lot of his karate training uh, come into play, uh, distancing and timing and things of that nature. So I'm sure that it, his training did help in the football uh, situation too. Mm. It's, it's something that seems to be a growing trend. You know, this realization that cross training an athlete <clears throat> with specific goals in mind can be really helpful. And of course, mm. anything that helps grow the martial arts is good in my book. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the thing is, is that uh, um, too many times I've seen, and I've seen it personally up close sometimes, some of the people 
uh, celebrities who claim that they train. Uh, I don't think they actually train. I, I think some of it's um, honorary rank or, uh, you know, along those lines for people to say, oh, that's my student. And uh, uh, I guess that's okay, too. But uh, uh, Andre, should say Andre was um, somebody who, who did train. He trained a lot, had his own dojo. And uh, his uh, wife trained, and she was uh, became black belt. And uh, he competed, and uh, you know, he definitely uh, he was involved. It wasn't just honorary in any way. Sure, sure. Yeah, it, it's an interesting thing the the notion of celebrity and the intersection with martial arts as it relates to rank. You know, we we see actors come in and and some of them have chops and some of them you know very mm-hmm. clearly or have stunt doubles and and just the, yeah the controversy that comes uh. from it which in my mind it's okay because then when we see someone who has both the the acting skills and the martial arts skills someone like mm-hmm. wesley snipes or michael jai white i mean look at them mm-hmm. just there's no doubt when they're on camera that they know what they're doing yeah uh, and again it's um um like you said, and I totally agree that um, anything that will promote karate uh, as an art form, uh, I'm for that. But um, you know, you, you also gotta call a duck a duck. You know what I'm saying? That uh, I mean, Elvis was. Uh, I mean, his karate was so bad. It was. <laughs> I don't know. I hate to say it, but it was, I watched a few clips on TV on uh, Facebook and. Uh, just I'm sorry, that, that's terrible, and so don't don't say it looks good because it's not you know, from any standpoint. But uh, you know, he uh, Elvis's name was huge at the time, and uh, I guess to have him uh, promoting karate or tempo or whatever it was, uh, I guess it's okay. Certainly, if nothing else, he exposed more people to martial arts, and I'm sure there were quite a few people who started training and likely found a love of training because he was. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Never about Hopefully, that. they stuck with it, and they, uh, you know, they uh, took it to a different level. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> One of the things I find to be universal is that we all have bad times. Mm-hmm. Martial artists have this unique toolbox of resources to go to, to make it through those bad times. I'm wondering if you might tell us about one of those times in your life and how your martial arts was helpful. Um, I, I probably the worst, the worst time was when I had a stroke. I was on my way to Okinawa in 1997 for, uh, the, uh, a karate tournament they were having their world championships. And I was, uh, uh, myself and Dennis May, we were both designated as chief referees for that event. I had taken uh, a group of people, including my son, Chad, on the team to go there to compete. And uh, I wound up, uh, we stopped in Alaska to refuel. And uh, I got off the plane and um, I was leaning against the wall talking uh, to one of my students. and. I couldn't understand what I was saying. It was all blurry to me, slurred. And uh, I thought I got probably should go out and get some air. And as soon as I took my hand off the wall, I collapsed. My whole left side was gone. Uh, they took me. Um, uh, I, I fought. I actually fought my way to get back on the plane. Uh, I could hardly walk. I was leaning against uh, Don Warner and trying to get back on the plane and uh, adamant that I was going to Okinawa. And uh, they came and got me off the plane and took me to the hospital in uh, uh, in Alaska. And uh, I had my son, Chad, contacted my wife, Lillian. And uh, right away, they, uh, they admitted me to the hospital. And um, I think because of karate training where we train equally on both sides uh uh not just one side so uh i think that helped maybe 
uh, redirect uh, where the blockage was in my brain, which is still there. Um, I think it helped redirect it to another route, and therefore I didn't suffer a lot of uh, damage uh, due to the stroke. And I think that uh, that was a scary time for me. And I would imagine that your rehab was shorter than average because of that. Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, the doctor started questioning me about uh, my activities and so on. And, and I explained to them about karate and, and how we train and everything. And uh, they kind of thought it, it definitely had something to do with, with uh, a, a recovery to where I wasn't, uh, my speech was, came back and um, my um, mobility uh, came back fairly quick. And um, but it was a, it was a full blown stroke, and um, they were kind of wondering too uh, why I'm making such great progress. <laughs> but I didn't I didn't go into therapy. I did my own therapy, and uh, uh, I knew what I I knew what I had to do, and I knew what it was going to take for me to get back to normal or as close to normal as I could get. And uh, I did it. So, again, karate helped me because of the discipline of understanding what it takes to get to that, uh, to that back to normal. And uh, I disciplined myself to do what, it, what I needed to do to do that. We've had a number of guests on the show who have been through some sort of medical condition, situation, and have universally credited martial arts with, if not being the thing that saved their life, but a huge <laughs> portion, you know, a major component of, of what allowed them to get through whatever that, mm -hmm. that physical struggle sure. was. So I'm, I'm not surprised that that was helpful to you. And certainly, you know, the, the left, right balance is pretty important. And so for any of you out there listening who only want to practice things on, on one side, the side that maybe you fight with. Here's a great reason to do both. <laughs> uh, also, uh, some years ago, I had a double hernia operation. Um, and uh, in order to, uh, to calm myself to when I was going into uh, the operating room, uh, while I was laying on the gurney, uh, getting ready to uh, push me into the uh, operating room, I started doing kata in my mind, over uh, visualizing in my mind uh, the different kata that I knew. And also, I started breathing, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation. And by the time I got into the operating room, I, I was limp as a rag. I mean, they were so relaxed. Uh, it was they, they were having difficulty getting me on the operating table. <laughs> I said, you know, come on, you got to stiffen up a little bit because <laughs> I was so limp. But uh, again, that, you know, uh, recently I just had two major operations on my legs for uh, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, aneurysms. Mm. And uh, I did the same thing again. I had one leg done, the right leg, and then a few months later I had the left leg done. And I did the same thing again. I relaxed myself by doing kata in my mind and also uh, regulating my breathing. And my rehab in both of those situations was um, very, very quick, uh, much quicker than normal. And again, talking to the uh, rehab people, I did go into rehab, talking to them, and uh, I said, you know, I don't need to be... Uh, uh, I, I'm self-disciplined, so you just tell me what you need me to do, and I'll do it. And my rehab in both cases was much, much quicker than uh, they expected. Not surprised at all. Mm -hmm. Now, we may have some folks out there listening who have never done kata forms mm -hmm. in their mind. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing that practice, you know, you're laying there, and you're imagining yourself going through the form— what are you thinking about? How are you approaching it? How fast do you do it? You know, someone that maybe has never done that before, how would you advise them on it? Um, that's hard. That's kind of hard to answer because um, in my mind, 
I, I do the kata the same way I'm going to perform it physically. In other words, my timing is the same. My The way I visualize the timing, uh, the way I visualize my movement, uh, the speed, it's exactly as if I was going to do it physically. And even when I was coaching uh, and uh, competing, uh, I'd see people over in the corner going over the kata, doing it over and over and over and over again physically. And I didn't do that. I'd do it in my mind. I'd do my kata over and over in my mind until I was comfortable with it and regulate my breathing again. And um, uh, I think visualization uh, in most cases, as far as I'm concerned, was a lot better than actually going off in the corner and practicing the kata physically over and over and over again. And uh, uh, again, that's that's me. Maybe it doesn't work for some people. I don't know. But uh, I, when I coached, I coached the same way that uh, I would ask people visually uh, to visualize what they were doing to uh, and visualize it visualize yourself doing it correctly and coming out a winner. I like that. You've mentioned a few people that were pretty important to you, but if you think back your entire martial arts career, all the people that you've trained under or taught or trained with, you know, wherever the hierarchy would lay out, if there was one that had the most impact on you, who would that be? Oh, that's that's easy. That's Sensei DeBase, Christy DeBase. Uh, he was my first teacher. I started karate because of him, watching him and being so impressed with what he was doing <clears throat> that made me want to emulate that. And um, he was such an influence early on, uh, not just in karate, but his outlook on life, his the way he approached things, the way he... Uh, dealt with uh, uh, people, the way he conducted his classes. Uh, and fortunately, I was the beneficiary of a lot of that because I emulated that. And in my early years, that was my solid foundation. And um, I'd have to say that more than anybody, uh, it would be uh, Sensei DeBase. Uh, people don't even know his name. He would never do interviews early on. He'd always refer him to somebody else. Uh, he was very low key. And uh, he was the one that um, he had some uh, difficulties, I guess, with the people that owned the judo dojo where, we, where he taught the judo twins. And uh, he quit teaching and he took me to Sensei Urban. And he asked Sensei Urban if he would take me in as a student. Because uh, he said he wasn't going to teach anymore. So Sensei Urban took me in uh, as a favor to Sensei DeBase. And at the time, Sensei Urban had a three-month waiting list. He had two levels, two uh, loft floors in Chinatown. And they were packed. And he had a three-month waiting list. So due to the, the kindness of him uh, doing a favor for Sensei DeBase... He took me in as a student, and that's how I got started in China, Chinatown Dojo. <clears throat> what do you think would have happened if he hadn't taken you, if he hadn't had Rome, hadn't made that exception? Oh, boy. I, I hate to think of what would happen, but uh, there was there was almost no karate in, in New York City at the time. I think there was Sensei the Base, there was um, Henry Cho, uh, who did the... Uh, at the time, it wasn't Taekwondo. It was just Korean karate. Uh, and uh, I think there was one other. Oh, Sensei Don Nagel in New Jersey. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't go to New Jersey because it was, it was bad enough that I was <coughs> living in the dojo and, and going home on the weekends. And I, <laughs> I wouldn't make the trip to New Jersey. So uh, that's interesting. I never even thought about that. I don't know. I guess I would have went back to judo. <laughs> mm. And the world would have been a different place. <laughs> now, if you had the opportunity to train with someone that you didn't, anywhere in time, anywhere in the world, unless, you know, they can be alive or dead, who would you have wanted to train with? Or who would you want to train with even now? Um, 
That's a good question also. It's um, obviously because I do uh, Okinawa Goju Ryu, <coughs> it would be uh, Miyagi Sensei, Miyagi Chojin Sensei. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that I was in Korea in 1950, and Chojin Sensei died in 1953. Had I even thought about karate or been involved in it, I could have actually taken uh, R&R and went to Okinawa from Korea and, and trained with him. That's, that's, I think about that a lot. And uh, uh, I don't know if, if they would have taken me at the time. I don't know if there was any uh, foreigners training with him. Uh, in the pictures that I see, I don't see any. Uh, but um, that would have been interesting. And, of course, um, being able to train with him at that time when Go he was developing <coughs> Goju Ryu would have been uh, an incredible experience. You mentioned having a team, a professional team, and being a mm -hmm. coach. I assume there was some competition involved there. <coughs> oh, yeah. Um, well, interestingly, um, it was actually the first professional team, karate team. And when I say the first, because... It was totally funded, and it was uh, the people on my team were all professionally uh, uh, taken care of money wise. They were paid, all expenses paid, airfare, hotel, food allowance, uh, prize money, uh, incentive uh, money. If they took first, second, or third in any event or grand champion, they got extra money for that also. So it was really a professional team in the sense that the athletes were paid and they were paid salaries and expenses. And that happened again. It seems like going back through my uh, uh, mind in, in my uh, career, everything seems to have happened by accident, being in the right place at the right time. And um, I had been going to Bermuda to help my friend, uh, Sensei Skipper Ingham run his little event that he had every year, and uh, he used to uh, he used to really take money out of his own pocket to run the event uh, just to keep Bermuda on the uh, karate map, so to speak. And one year, uh, he kept telling me about this student that he had that was very wealthy, and that. Uh, but every year that I went down, uh, the gentleman was never on the island; he was somewhere else. One year I went, and he was there. He invited me and um, uh, my wife and uh, Miyazaki Sensei and his wife out to his house uh, for lunch and to talk about karate. And we went out and we talked to him about it. And uh, it seemed like he was under the impression that karate was um, a professional sport already. And that, you know, like golf or tennis or whatever. And he was kind of uh, uh, amazed to find out that it was just the opposite, that it cost us money to do that. <laughs> we didn't make any money. And even if you won a grand championship for a couple hundred dollars, it still, you know, it still costs you money to go to the event. Um, he decided to fund Skipper's next event. And um, he gave him uh, a, a lot of money to run the event. And Skipper asked me to help him run it. So I put it together for him. And we uh, we came up with the first uh, BIG, Bermuda Invitational Grand Championship in Bermuda, with big prize money, $25,000 prize money. Um, I invited a certain number of competitors and a certain number of officials who I paid all their expenses to come to compete. And... Um, uh, through my sponsor, I paid. And it was a huge success. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Jeff Smith came out of retirement to come down here to compete, <laughs> which I thought was great. You know, and uh, we had the top notch people that I invited, top competitors. And uh, it, went, it went tremendous. And we did it two years in a row. And then uh, my sponsor asked, uh, well, can we make it? Uh, can we make it a little bit bigger? Can we get more people to come? So I said, sure. I said, probably if you if you uh, offer them more money, you'll get more interest. So he said, okay, we'll 
give him fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> and of course, I, I, you know, I'm thinking that this is a dream. All of this is really going to happen, but it happened. And uh, so instead of now BIG, instead of Bermuda Invitational Grain Championship, we made it the Bermuda International Grain Championship, and it was open to anybody that wanted to come. And uh, we did that uh, for a couple of years, and then. My sponsor asked me if I would like to have a professional team. And I said, well, sure. What, what do you mean by professional? He said, well, you put a team together, a traveling team, uh, to compete in the events, uh, karate events around the country or around the world, and I'll, I'll pay for it. You make out a budget, and if we agree on the budget, I'll, I'll fund it. So my wife and I got together, and we made out a budget. And we thought it was like playing with Monopoly money as far as we were concerned. We yeah, put this in. No, go ahead, put that in. And so we took the budget down to Bermuda, had a meeting with my sponsor, and he approved the whole budget. And um, we were off. I, I contacted uh, the team, the members, the people that I, the competitors that I wanted on the team, and I. Uh, our first event that I invited them to was uh, Don Rodriguez's Ocean State Nationals. Uh, I sent them all a plane ticket, booked their rooms at the hotels, and we had a meeting. And I had an attorney there for them, and I had an attorney there for me. And I told them what the plans were. I offered them a contract to sign a contract with me to, to compete as a competitor on my professional team. And... Uh, there were a couple of guys hemming and hawing around this and, and said, well, you know, can I take the contract and have my attorney look at it? I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. But I said, when you come back with the contract, I might have somebody in your place. So it's either now or not. You know? They all signed the contract. So now my professional team was intact. And our first event was, as I said, at uh, Don Rodriguez's Ocean State Grand Nationals. And then from there on, I booked uh, all the major tournaments for my team uh, on the NASCAR circuit, uh, and we competed in all the events, the major events in the country. Went undefeated for five years, and uh, including competition in Europe, uh, Germany, Austria, um, and uh, Italy, and um, we did that for about six years, and then. Uh, Due to a number of different circumstances, uh, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, some of it had to do with members of the team who were good athletically, but uh, character-wise weren't so good, and I had to deal with them. Sure. And I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to deal with them. So uh, my sponsor was a little put off by me not wanting to do it anymore. And I tried to explain to him why. And um, uh, it's funny because at that time, this was, you know, before 9-11, and traveling was a whole lot easier. Than, and after that, uh, I don't think it would have been too much fun trying to drag 24 people around the country. <laughs> I should say not. Well, I had 24 people on the team, including a team doctor who was Eddie Andahar. Uh, I had uh, two assistant coaches, uh, Toki Hill and Skipper Ingham. Uh, my wife was the manager. She made all the arrangements for the whole team, uh, all the airfare, all the uh, booking the hotel rooms, paying for the entry fees, paying for the... And we had four training camps a year that, that they were paid to come to. And uh, truly, truly a real professional team. Wow. It's incredible, and, and to my knowledge, mm. there's nothing else that has existed like it before or since. No, no. Um, I think you know. I didn't get. Uh, I didn't get much help from uh, the tournament directors in NASCAR. Uh, in fact, um, uh, my my sponsor was getting mail in his. He has a, he had an office in. Uh, 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 I want to say. Houston or Dallas, uh, transfer of oil, and they would send, people would send letters to him uh, 
wanting to wanting him to give the sponsorship to them instead of me and and so on so he would take any letters that he got like that he would put in a in a box and when i would go to see him he would give me he'd say here's your mail <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. he was loyal it's good uh, he would he would say here's your mail yeah <laughs> How about but, some of the but, members of that team? Any names that we might recognize? Oh, pick one. <laughs> Ashley Anderson, Billy Blanks, Tokyo Hill, um, Linda Denley, uh, um, Anthony Price, Richard Plowden, uh, uh, Chip Wright, uh, Keith Hirabayashi, uh, Christine Bannon, Rodriguez. Uh, on and on and on. Um, I just, if if you took the rating systems at the time in the magazines, if you took the top three in every division, that's who I probably had on the team. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I got I got uh, criticized for signing up the best people. Well, yeah, you know, they said uh, I get complaints about. Well, you can't go to the Transworld Oil event. Uh, they're going to win. They're going to win anyway. And my question was, well, when was the last time he beat Billy Planks? Or when's the last time he beat Nasty Anderson or Richard? <laughs> Never. So what there was, you know, it was just an excuse to complain, complain, complain. Instead of embracing it and using it as an opportunity to get maybe more sponsorship involved by showing a real professional attitude uh, toward um, uh, trying to professionalize karate. Uh, it was just the opposite. It's a fascinating piece of history, and I, I know it. The names you mentioned, and and the ways they came onto the team, and and where they went after the team. It's just it's a an interesting intersection of so many <coughs> pieces of martial arts history, and I, I just want to encourage the folks out there listening to check it out, to do some research on the Trans World Oil team. You know, we'll throw some links up at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for anybody that might be new. We have our show notes page that goes along with every episode, but there's far more out there that than we can link to. So check it well, out. When, uh, I, had, I had, on the team, I had uh, a lot, uh, I had a mixture of traditional uh, competitors like uh, um, Domingo Llanos, he was the first American to win a silver medal in the world championships. Uh, uh, Jean Frenette, who uh, most people think of uh, Jean Frenette as musical kata, which he was very famous for. But Jean started training with me at a very young age in Goju Ryu and competed in traditional tournament also. And so I had people like that. And um, uh, I, had a, I had a mixture and... Uh, most of the team, the majority of the team acted very professional, and a few didn't. So uh, they 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 were a minority, so to speak, in the sense that they were only a very few. A lot of fun talking about those those uh, times, and and just you know, I'm, I'm sitting here just kind of. Wishing I could have toured around, you know, just kind of followed around with the team. Yeah. I had one guy ask me at a tournament, uh, how come I'm not on your team? I said, because I got the guy to beat you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, amazing, amazing that the attitudes uh, of, uh, I, I'll say greed and I'll say, personal gain, personal profit uh, that was prevalent in response to me having that team. And uh, which to me should have been just the opposite. It could have been an amazing opportunity for yeah. the martial arts world for legitimizing oh, and, and expanding competition. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think causes that, that greed? Because it's something, you know, it's kind of similar to, our discussion very early on about rank and politics, it, <laughs> mm -hmm. it seems like they go together. Where, where does that come from? Is it just human nature? Is it inevitable? Yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, um, Miyagi sensei was asked one time about, uh, at least this is 
what I've heard. He was asked uh, that, isn't it true that, you know, karate uh, will make you a better person and make your character better? And he said, no, that's up to you. The possibilities are there. Certainly the tools are there. But whether you, you have to make yourself a better person. And you can use karate to help you do it. Um, but I see uh, too many times, way too many times, uh, people involved in uh, martial arts have a tendency to let the ego go crazy, think there's something that they're not, uh, use it as a, a power position or, you know, get to, because people will bow or, or listen to them and take or take their instruction, it puts them on a on a different level, and uh, it just um, you know it's just people being people, I guess. Let's talk about movies. Do you have a, a favorite martial arts film? No, um, I Do don't you- watch. Many, I, I like uh, the Japanese movies, the samurai movies, okay. um, but uh, I don't really watch uh, martial arts movies. I, I, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, uh, I like that that movie, The Last Dragon. I thought that was good. I, mm. I, I thought that was really funny and it uh, was well played. Uh, but to have a favorite, no, just the samurai movies, yeah. One of my favorites is the trilogy, the Samurai trilogy of uh, Musashi, uh, how that developed. And, and that was that movie, that, that the three-part movie um, showed him as a young boy and then as the uh, middle of his life and at the end of his life and uh, how he, uh, he changed so much from that young brash boy. Uh, to an older man who uh, who had developed a deep, deep understanding of his of his art of of the sword art, I thought it was really phenomenal. Mm. Some absolutely wonderful, wonderful movies mm. oh, yeah. in that genre that that kind of get overshadowed, especially with the more modern movies. It's, it's worth going back, and you know they're they're popping up in weird places. Older ones you can find on YouTube, yeah. and some of them are on yeah. Netflix. And, mm-hmm. and yeah. How how about books? Are you a reader? You know, I used to be. Um, I used to read a lot, and uh, over the years, I don't know. I, I can't. Uh, I don't seem to concentrate. Uh, like I'll, I'll flip through stuff. I'll uh, speed read it and get the main gist of what it is. But I can't sit down and read from start to finish <laughs> for some reason. Were there any martial arts books that you found helpful or, or anything you'd recommend to the, the listeners? Um, you know, when I started out uh, in judo, I had two books that were done by, that were written by Hal Sharp. And uh, they were my Bible. I, uh, I read them from start to finish and back again and back again and back again. And, uh, uh, Years later, much years later, I got to meet Sensei Sharp at Don Warner's uh, office in, in L.A., which I thought was great. And, of course, I jabbered on like a young teenager uh, about uh, his uh, development in, karate, in uh, judo. And he was one of the – that was the first books that I ever bought with his first two. And when I got uh, the – uh, Jigoro Kano's book, uh, the Kodokan um, book, mm, yeah. uh, that was incredible at the time for me to read that and to know that it was it came from the founder. And uh, other than that, uh, I, I don't, there, there's so much. The problem is with books is that we have to, we have to take them for what they are, they're, they're written by people, and people will put their own slant into uh, that writing. And if we can understand that uh, that it, you can't take everything for gospel, that it's correct, you got to do your own research and 
fortunately, today we have the, the Internet. We can do a lot of research and uh, balance things off. Read this, read that, and then compare the two. And eventually, uh, uh, you get closer to the truth that way. The truth is as much as you can get to it. Right, right. I, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I'm curious, because I have you and we're, we're talking about it. What is your thought on... on Evolution. This is, this is a subject that's coming up a lot in martial arts, the idea of trying to strike a balance between paying homage to what was set out by the founder of a style versus <coughs> evolution. Some people take a very polarized opinion, one absolute mm -hmm. or the other. Most are somewhere in the middle. I'm curious of your thoughts. Well, um, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying, and especially with the advent of like the Brazilian jiu-jitsu thing came on strong and the, the MMA and uh, all of these innovations over the years have um, sort of reared their head on the, on the martial arts scene. Um, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, and this is a personal opinion of mine, I don't need anything else. I, I, I found Goju to you, I got more in that than I could ever handle in a lifetime studying it. Um, we only have 12 kata, and there's a reason for that, because the kata is very deep, and it's ever-changing. The, the way you can use it is ever-changing. Uh, as you grow older, as you uh, mature in, in your understanding of karate, uh, you look at things differently over the years. And um, Sensei Urban said this. He said, uh, it's like the alphabet. You don't add a word, uh, a letter to the alphabet, and you don't take a letter away. If you did, it would be total chaos, okay? The, the alphabet is our foundation for our language. Uh, <clears throat> he said, uh, Shakespeare used the same alphabet that I use. Why was he Shakespeare and I'm not? It's the way he used the words and, and the letters. And, the, you know, you have prose, poetry, drama, comedy, etc. And they're all expressions of the same 26 letters. And uh, uh, if people feel the need to do something else, I don't believe in cross-training either. Uh, uh, if I liked Wei Chi to you, I love it. But I would do that. I would not do Goju anymore. I'd do that. Uh, I think that if you try to do too much, you can't be really good at anything. And with uh, Miyagi Sensei was a genius in the way he created Goju Ryu, in the sense that there's something in there for everybody. And he taught kata according to somebody's body size, their height, their weight, their uh, special things that they were uh, proficient at, the speed or, or uh, using their body properly, etc. He would teach them the, the kata that fit them. And uh, I'm, I'm adamant about kata is not something that uh, you learn and go on to the next one. You take the kata is a pattern that you learn. From that pattern, you develop a different understanding. The older you get, the better you get, the more understanding you have of karate. You develop different um, understanding of that same pattern throughout your training period. So kata is what you develop from that pattern over a long period of training. Uh, you could, um, I taught at Aaron Banks' dojo on Broadway in New York City. We used to get Broadway dancers come in just for the exercise. And they could pick up a kata in about a half hour. That's what they do for a living. Put your foot here, move here, turn here, go back. And so if it's just the pattern, then you learn 12 of them real quick, and what do you do after that if there's no meaning to it? Mm. I guess you're pretty much done. <laughs> <laughs> but you're never done. Yeah, never done. Never it's done. a journey, right? It's, a, it's what they tell me. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm still walking. I haven't found the end. Oh, yeah. No, no. There's a lot more questions than there are answers. And here's how those sensei told me when I first met him and started training in, in Okinawa. He said, there's no secrets in karate. Secrets are just things that you haven't discovered for yourself yet by training. There's no secrets. You know, like uh, uh, 
this lightning bolt's going to come down and all of a sudden you're enlightened. No, it doesn't happen. I was fortunate enough to train uh, with Miyazato Sensei while he was still alive and with Iha Sensei, who was also a student of Miyagi Sensei. And uh, when, um, after Miyagi Sensei passed away, uh, a, a year later, a meeting was held. And at that meeting, it was decided by this genius, you know, Miyagi Sensei seniors, who would lead them now because uh, Miyagi Sensei had not designated a, a successor. And uh, it was decided at that meeting that Miyazato Sensei would lead. And I have all the minutes of that meeting that Iya Sensei was present at the meeting and took the notes and uh, who was there, what they, what was said, and how it was, how it was uh, decided that Miyagi -sen Miyazato Sensei would be uh, Miyagi Sensei's uh, successor. And interestingly enough. <coughs> Miyagi Sensei, being the genius that he was, knew that even if he designated a successor, that once he was gone, people are going to do whatever they want to do. Uh, because he said so and so, doesn't mean that's who they'd follow. People follow, follow a natural leader. After Miyagi Sensei passed away, uh, Miyazato Sensei opened up the, uh, the Jundokan, and all of the seniors went to the Jundokan to train. All of the equipment, the training equipment that was in the garden dojo was transferred to the Jundokan. The statue, the bust um, of Miyagi Sensei was brought to the Jundokan. So people followed a natural leader. They didn't need to be told where to go. What's keeping you going? You know, you're still... You're still going. You know, martial arts is still an important part of your life. You're still so passionate about it. Yeah. And after a number of years, a lifetime of martial arts, the question I have is, is why? Where's, where's the motivation for you in continuing that? I'm like the Energizer Bunny, I guess, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, going on. Uh, it's, it's fascinating because it's always something new to me. The more I dig, the more I get involved in it, the more I uh, teach. Um, right now, I'm, I'm physically unable to do karate. I can't. Uh, I'm, I have to use a walker and a wheelchair. But uh, that has nothing to do with whether I can still train or not. I train differently. I train mentally, and I, I still teach seminars, and I still travel. And uh, the more I do that, the more... I see things that I missed, and uh, I should have thought of that. Oh, you know, in the kata, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, we could do that, sure. So the bunkai, which is now becoming very popular, by the way, which was never mentioned when I started karate, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden it's become the fad. Um, but uh, bunkai means to analyze. It doesn't mean to uh, apply. You analyze it from the analyzation. You apply Bunkai is, to me, is a constantly changing thing. Why? Because of, of different circumstances change. You you learn by understanding uh, Bunkai uh, or how to analyze kata. You come up with a lot of different uh, situations at work. And depending on my physical ability, depending on the other person's uh, ability or lack of ability, um, it just uh, doesn't end. And that was the genius of uh, Miyagi Sensei also with uh, devising this method of Goju Ryu that uh, if, if you understand it and know how to use it properly, uh, it's uh, a never ending source of information. If people want to reach you, you know, websites or social media or, you know, whatever you're comfortable giving out. Mm -hmm. Or you mentioned seminars. If you know, I don't know if those seminars are are you know if anyone can schedule you to come in. You know, tell us about that <laughs> stuff, if you would. Yeah, I um, basically what I what I teach is not really stylized in the sense. Other than if I get invited to a Goju to you dojo, of course, you know we'll we'll talk about and practice kata and, and kion bunkai and oyo bunkai, etc. But uh, Otherwise, I teach a very uh, general 
karate, so to speak. Um, in competition, uh, the three elements to, to scoring a point is real simple, timing, distance, and target. So when I was coaching, I developed different drills to enhance timing, distance, and target. And when I would coach the U.S. team, I would have people from all over the country on the team and from different styles. So I, my thought was, in a short period of time, the couple of weeks I'm going to have them at the, the world championships, I'm not going to make the punch any quick, uh, any stronger, the kicks any faster, or develop any new technique for them in that short period of time. So what I could do is develop these drills for timing, distance, and target awareness, which you can enhance in a short period of time. And uh, so we do a lot of those when I do seminars, different drills. And uh, uh, what, what really uh, solidified my thoughts on that about how important drills are, I go and watch, uh, so say, Andre Tippett uh, practice with the Patriots, and they do drills all week. They don't play. They only play football on Sunday. They don't play football every day. They do drills every day. And so they play football on Sunday. <laughs> so I thought, why can't the same thing apply to karate competition? Develop the drills and then look at, look at, uh, analyze my players, uh, the people, my competitors, and enhance, try to enhance what they already do well, which is play on their strengths and uh, work the drills for, the, for their uh, uh, timing, distance, and target awareness. It's fascinating stuff. How would someone reach you if they, if, if they, <clears throat> if they want to book you? What's um, the best way? I'm on Facebook. And uh, uh, other than that, uh, I don't have a website. Uh, probably Facebook or uh, uh, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, uh, I guess I guess Facebook probably. Okay. Well, well, we'll put a link to your personal Facebook page on the show okay. notes so people can, can find that easily enough. I have... Just one more question. I really appreciate sure. your time today. Parting advice, words of wisdom, if you will, for the folks listening. Never quit. <laughs> always, always one more step forward, one more step forward. Um, if you, karate has so much to offer. Um, and depending on what you want to get out of karate, if competition, is uh, for a short period of time. Uh, karate training is can be forever, and it doesn't have to be physical. At some point, maybe your physical abilities, like mine, are, are hampered. Uh, if you're training properly and you understand uh, the uh, karate experience, you can still train and you can practice karate all your life. I want to thank you, Merriman Sensei, for being on this episode. Your story is inspiring, and it's one that I'm sure will resonate with so many of the listeners. You've shown us that your contributions to the arts are much more than simply coaching or competition. It is the life you've spent. Thank you, Sensei Chuck Merriman. Of course, you can find the show notes for this episode, for any of the other episodes, at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And over there, we have some photos, we have some links, other stuff that you might want to check out for this as all those other episodes. You can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We get some videos up on YouTube now and again. You might want to check those out. And of course, you can check out all of our products and the other things that we do at our digital home, whistlekick.com. If you want to put forth yourself or someone else as a potential guest for the show, there's a form at Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio for you to do that, or you can just email in Info at whistlekick.com, whatever's easier for you. We love to hear from you. We love that feedback that comes in, even the criticism, as long as it's kind. It's a reference to episode 249. Regardless, I thank you for your time today. I hope all is well in your world. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.
Yeah. <laughs>